Uh, welcome to today's IMSC popular lecture. Uh, this is going to be given by my esteemed colleague, Professor Manjari Bhagchi. Before uh, she gives a talk, uh, I have a couple of announcements to make. This talk is streamed live over YouTube. And anybody who is watching on YouTube and would like to ask a question, you are welcome to uh, write your questions on the comments box there. Uh, one of our moderators is actually uh, monitoring the comments box and your questions will be asked to Professor Bakchi at the end of the talk. Uh, so today's talk will be moderated by my colleague, physicist, uh, Professor Sayantan Sharma. Uh, before he takes over and uh, introduces Professor Bakchi, I would like our director, Professor Ravindran, to say a few words. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, thanks, uh, Arijit. Uh, this year, uh, we all know that uh, we are celebrating 60 years of IMSC. IMSC is uh, IMSC turned 60 in, in the beginning of the year. And uh, in order to celebrate, we have a series of special lectures, heritage talks uh, of many kind, actually, by eminent and distinguished uh, scientists and mathematicians from our institute, also from organization, organizations close by, or also abroad. And uh, today's um, speaker is our uh, colleague, Professor Manjari Bakchi, who is going to tell us about uh, some of the excitements in astrophysics and cosmology, I suppose. Um, and of course, we'll have more talks in the coming months. Um, so I request uh, Sayantan to introduce her, actually, for those, you know, watching it from YouTube. Thank you. Hello. Welcome, everyone. So it's a uh, pleasure. Thanks, Professor Avindan, for uh, introducing about the uh, lecture series, which is a part of our Azadi Ka Amrit Mahotsav celebrations, which uh, Arijit is spearheading and also uh, it is also a part of the 60th year celebration so it's a pleasure to have today a popular talk by my colleague professor manjari bakchi so uh, she has um, she is, uh, has done her phd from uh, university of calcutta uh, in uh, 2007 and then she was a postdoc at tata institute of fundamental research subsequently at Iuka and U University of West Virginia. And after a few months stint at the ICTS, she joined here as a faculty member. So she is actually leading the Indian efforts towards uh, in the Indian pulsar ti timing array experiments. So this is a very novel experiment where one use, uses the indigenously built uh, the GMRT, the giant meter wave radio telescope, which is in Pune. And they use this, actually, uh, they use this experiment to look at the, or hear the sounds of the gravitational wave, the nanohertz ones, which actually come from the very early universe by looking at the pulsars or neutron stars, uh, array of them in the sky. And they have suggested very nice measurements in this upgraded GMRT. And she will tell us more about this to, in today's talk. So it's a great pleasure to uh, request her to please uh, resume her talk. Good afternoon. Thanks, Shantan. And I thank uh, my uh, colleagues, uh, Professor Arijit and Professor Ravindran, for giving me this opportunity to tell you about the natural laboratories I love to e use to understand various theories of physics. Uh, and that includes pulsar timing array experiment that already Shayantan mentioned. But, uh, but that is not everything. We can do it to do more experiments, including uh, the, uh, uh, understanding nature of matter at very high densities testing alternative theories of gravity and many other things. But what are these natural laboratories? 
they are a special kind of stars uh, called neutron stars and i call, uh, call them undead stars so i'll tell you what are neutron stars means why they are called neutron stars and why I, uh, we call them undead stars means what are li alive stars what are dead stars what are undead star so uh, everything we will try to uh, talk today in brief uh, so, but before that probably you know when we look at the night sky all the stars we see are uh, not the same right uh, there are very different types of stars so if you look at the most beautiful constellation orion you probably know that be, uh, star betelgeuse looks very red uh, that is called a red uh, giant then the star regal which is very bluish that is actually a blue super giant then there is a dog star sirius uh, the, and probably you know that although in our naked eyes we see only one star it is actually a binary star means there are two stars gravitationally bound to each other and they are orbiting common center of mass the brighter one is a normal alive star like our sun we call it a main sequence star but it has a companion means as i said it is a binary star the companion is a faint star uh, well faint in uh, optical wavelength but not in other wavelength that is a white dwarf and uh, what are white dwarfs which we'll know today uh, but uh, now i can only tell you that white dwarfs are also another kind of undead stars so uh, but before going to undead stars if you ask okay so are all those different stars are totally different the answer is no they are actually different life uh, cycles with different phases of life of, uh, of a single star. like a butterfly was a caterpillar one day uh, uh, similarly our sun when it uh, will grow, grow old it will become a red giant and then eventually it will become a white dwarf and after long long time uh, a white dwarf can become a black dwarf remember there is something different uh, uh, difference between a black dwarf and a black hole so what are these means uh, just now i mentioned what happens to star uh, the sun but when uh, a massive star grows old when say a star which is 10 times heavier than the sun uh, it becomes a red super giant means slow mass stars become red giant heavier stars become red super giant and when those red super giants at the end they die through violent explosions we call supernova explosions and they become either a neutron star or a black hole so they are also a dead star uh, but now forget black hole because black holes uh, we know they are very compact they are strongly gravitating even photon cannot come but this uh, neutron stars and uh, the, the end product of low mass star white dwarfs they both emit electromagnetic energy means we can detect them we know they exist that is why we call them undead star uh, so, uh, so, but before telling you the interior structure let me first convince you that they are very weird and very exotic object so uh, i said that alive stars like sun we call them main sequence star and not all the main sequence stars are of the same mass means a main sequence star can be lighter than the sun or maybe 100 times or some, sometimes more than 100 times heavier than the sun and they have magnetic field lying in the range of 1 to uh, 100 gauss usually and for sun you know the magnetic field of the sun is around 10 gauss but now to compare let us take a sample main sequence star say our sun so here you see in there are few columns uh, the last column is for black hole forget right first column for main sequence second for white dwarf third for neutron star so if i take a main sequence star 
like sun whose mass is just like sun which we call one solar mass and the symbol of solar mass is like m then one circle inside a dot that uh, symbol was actually uh, used by egyptians and ancient egyptians hieroglyphic symbol that we borrowed uh, we astronomers because every time we are not going to write uh, the m sun or solar mass so if you have a main sequence uh, of one solar mass its radius is around 10 to the power 6 kilometer you can calculate the density now if you have a white dwarf of the same mass one solar mass its radius is in the order of 10 to the power 4 kilometer so the radius uh, of a white dwarf is two order of magnitude smaller so density will be much higher now if you have a neutron star of the same mass one solar mass its radius is 10 kilometer diameter is about 20 kilometers so to give you some idea of what is 20 kilometers just half an hour ago i was checking the distance between imsc to cmi is 22 kilometer so imagine that you have one object as heavy as our sun but its diameter is only 20 kilometers so its density is very very high and what is this high density why it is so dense and what is the form of matter okay that we are going to tell uh, so, but before that another point we need to remember is magnetic field I told you that magnetic field of main sequence stars is in the range of 1 to 100 Gauss and probably you know the sun is it is around 10 Gauss and even our earth has magnetic field but that is very small less than a Gauss and if it helps the fridge magnets we have those are 50 Gauss so this is just for some sake of comparison white doors are much stronger magnets their magnetic fields lie in the range of 10 to the power 3 to 10 to the power 9 Gauss and neutron stars are even stronger magnet their magnetic field is 10 to the power 9 to 10 to the power 15 Gauss means various neutron stars have various values of magnetic fields so before knowing what are neutron stars at this point you know that they are a kind of very uh, it's a strange object they are extremely strong magnets and very compact very dense object and because they are so dense they are very strongly gravitating so to understand gravitational phenomena around neutron star uh, the most of the time classical mechanics is not enough you need general theory of relativity and that uh, will come but why do we call these neutron stars and white dwarfs are they are undead stars to understand the, uh, that first we need to understand what are alive stars alive stars means uh, like our sun sun is emitting uh, the energy but it is not cold yet why because there is a constant generation of heat from nuclear fusion and that is giving uh, the, the creating uh, the heat energy now another thing you may remember that sun, sun or other alive stars they are big blobs of hydrogen or helium gas but why we get a structure means it is not a diffuse uh, gas because it is a very very huge mass together right so because of self gravity uh, it is holding together and you are getting a spherical uh, block and you say okay it is gravitating so why it is not collapsing because of what we just said it is very hot and we all know from our class 9 physics that energy temperature gives rise to pressure right ideal gas law pv equal to nkt and that is actually equation of state of normal matter normal gaseous matter and uh, we will see uh, how we can calculate equation of state for white dwarf and neutron star but equation of state means the relation between pressure and density now i just said that there is constant generation of heat what is the mechanism that is nuclear fusion right in big bang nucleosynthesis you got hydrogen and helium and then in stars 
uh, there is nuclear fusion and if it is a low mass star you get uh, the carbon from helium nothing else if you have slightly heavier mass of star uh, you get few other elements right o like oxygen silicon iron but nothing else iron is very stable you cannot get nuclear fusion from iron then you will ask okay so uh, uh, where all these other elements uh, from periodic table came from and i like this periodic table means i hope when uh, i wish or when in class 8 or somewhere we first see uh, a periodic table they don't show us such colorful thing because many things were not known that time now you look uh, the different color codes are actually different formation mechanism like the, uh, the like, uh, like blue one which is uh, hydrogen and helium is a uh, big uh, big, uh, big bang nucleosynthesis now you see different colors like uh, inside stars you get the uh, green things exploding massive stars but most interesting is the orange one uh, which says uh, merging neutron stars means if there are two neutron stars and they merge and i will uh, tell about this uh, scenario a little bit more uh, then all, all these elements can form and uh, you can see there are many elements which can form only via merger of neutron star and for a long time it was only a theoretical prediction but few years ago when first time a gravitational wave event was detected by LIGO Virgo they did electromagnetic observation also and those signature of the observations matched, matched uh, very well with those theoretical prediction of formation of those high elements so uh, you can notice what are the elements and interestingly means like precious elements like gold and silver they are also formed uh, through a merger of neutron stars so i think in future when you will wear a gold jewelry you will remember where it came from it came uh, via merger of two neutron stars so now uh, that is another interesting aspect of neutron star so we know that uh, they are end product of stars means this is the simplified form of uh, the life cycle of stars means a sun like star a sunlight average star becomes red giant becomes they eventually becomes white dwarf massive star becomes red super giant then either a neutron star and if very massive becomes like a black hole you will, uh, and we know that white dwarfs and neutron stars are very dense but what is their inside means i just said that there is uh, for a life star there is nuclear fusion going on and i also say that after iron there is no more nuclear fusion so when inside a star when nuclear fusion is going on there will come a stage when all nuclear fuel is consumed no more nuclear uh, fusion is possible but the star keeps on emitting right so th that time the star uh, just starts to cool down and the star was stable when the outward gas pressure means came from uh, because of the temperature balanced gravity now temperature is falling but gravity is constant right because the star is not losing mass so gravity wins and star uh, starts to collapse and during that time what happens first there are atoms of uh, different elements they will come close together but if gravity is very high uh, the two atoms will come just close to uh, each other but it can also happen because of extreme gravitational squeeze that atoms break and then you, we know inside atom there is nucleus and then electrons in different atomic or uh, electron orbitals right but gravity can break this uh, or orbital structure and you will get free nuclei and free electrons and uh, they can come closer together because electrons and nuclei are smaller in size you will say okay then uh, can we bring them very close together no because you remember electrons are fermions so they give that quantum mechanical pressure degeneracy pressure and if that quantum mechanical pressure balances gravity uh, 
you get stable start structure which is known as white dwarf. If gravity is too high then even this electron degeneracy pressure cannot balance uh, gravity. Then inside there are nuclei means inside nuclei you had proton and neutrons like that will also break. You will get free neutrons, protons and electrons and because of Coulomb attraction some protons will uh, attract uh, electrons and uh, become neutrons. So you will have mostly a soup of neutrons and neutrons are also fermions. They will again give uh, uh, degeneracy pressure and if that degeneracy pressure balances gravity you again get stable star structure which are neutron star. So now we know so what are white dwarfs and what are neutron star and as I said that the relation between pressure and density is known as equation of state and probably if physics students you have calculated uh, equation of state for white dwarfs in uh, any statistical mechanics book the relation between pressure and density. For neutron star it is not easy to, although we say equation of state it is not easy to write a polytropic form uh, as equation of state well so most of the time we just give a tabulated form because they look very strange because here there you have only uh, mostly uh, neutrons and some theory believes there will be other uh, uh, exotic particles hyperons and some theory believes there will be free quarks also so it is not very easy to calculate or compute equation of states of neutron star. So here I show you some of the popular uh, uh, equation of states which just the plot x axis is density and y axis is pressure. Uh, it is just to tell you that how different can be uh, different equation of state and we do not know which equation of state is correct. That is one open challenge we will uh, uh, tell us and using those equation of state you can uh, solve the equation for hydrostatic equilibrium to get the mass and radius of a neutron star means if the mass of a neutron star is two solar mass what will be its radius. So that you need to solve these equations and for the time being uh, so look at this plot mass radius diagram of neutron star x axis is radius in kilometer y axis is mass. There are many things but you forget this uh, gray region for the time being and those red horizontal lines for the time being we will come to those later. Just concentrate on those curved lines. Those are theoretical values of mass radius curves for different equation of state. How you can interpret the, that? So say I believe in this one equation of state called AP4 and I measure one neutron star of mass 2 solar mass. So I can say okay its radius is around 11 kilometer means slightly less than 11 kilometer. But if you have one neutron star of one solar mass and I believe in the same uh, equation of state I could say oh its radius is slightly higher 11.5 kilometer. Uh, and say if uh, you believe in another equation of ms2 you will say oh no no a two solar mass neutron star have radius larger than 14.5 uh, kilometer. So unfortunately using our pulsar studies means uh, we can measure masses of neutron stars but not the radius. If we could do we could get a po uh, observed point in this theoretical diagrams and we could say oh this is the correct equation of state but that we cannot do yet. We can measure masses and how we can measure masses using neutron star that I will tell you uh, today. And then uh, probably you remember I said some very massive stars become black holes. So uh, black holes are also exotic because they are even uh, denser and uh, they help to study gravity. Now why uh, so you know what are neutron stars, what are uh, white dwarfs and you will say okay they are dead star but why I call them undead stars because they still emit electromagnetic energy and we see them. Uh, so how do they emit uh, that I will tell you but before that uh, remember not only white dwarfs and neutron stars means any stars means alive star or giant star uh, 
they emit in the throughout the spectrum of electromagnetic uh, waves means not only the optical uh, range which we can uh, see they emit throughout the spectrum and we can if you have proper detector you can detect them but unfortunately our atmosphere blocks most of the part uh, of electromagnetic spectrum coming from outside only the uh, optical range can come i think that is the one of the reason our eyes evolved to detect in this range and then radio wavelength can also reach uh, the earth surface and for the other like x-ray gamma rays which are coming towards earth from various stars atmosphere blocks them but you can detect them if you can place your detector in satellites means above the atmosphere so that is how we study stars mostly in optical or radio and radio is so clean do uh, large domain so i will tell and as i said that uh, for alive star the main source of emission is thermal right because of nuclear fusion it generates heat it emits that but it has also strong magnetic field, right? So there are other high energetic uh, phenomena which you study like Bremster lung, synchrotron radiation, inverse co Compton scattering, all those happens in the magnetosphere of a, uh, an alive star. What about white dwarfs? White dwarfs are even stronger magnets, right? So those high energetic phenomena are even more prominent. Also, there is thermal emission uh, because now there is no more nuclear fusion going on inside a, a white dwarf, but it created energy, right? So it is hot. So that heat, it keeps on emitting. So the, the, there is a combination of emission mechanism. And uh, that is why uh, it's a, it's a white dwarfs can be brighter in uh, high energy, like in X-ray, CSB, which is a white dwarf, is brighter than the main sequence, Sirius A. What about neutron star? All these phenomena I mentioned for white dwarfs are applicable for neutron stars because they are even stronger magnet. But there are other phenomena which makes neutron stars even more interesting. One is accretion. As I just mentioned about Sirius, that Sirius A and B are binary stars. They are gravitationally bound to each other. There are many stars which are gravitationally bound to each other. That means there are many binary stars. So if you have a neutron star gravitationally bound to a red giant or red super giant, uh, which are very uh, bloated object, neutron star can actually pull matter uh, from that companion to it. And when that matter from the companion falls on the neutron star surface, there is an uh, X-ray beam and that X-ray beam you can detect if you have X-ray detector. Like this type of neutron star we call uh, accretion power, means this phenomena of pulling matter we call accretion. So these are accretion powered neutron star. But the most interesting, uh, well, I mean most interesting to me are the rotation powered neutron stars or, or uh, pulsars, uh, which uh, is, is actually due to uh, the, the strong, very strong magnetic field. So like for Earth, we know the magnetic axis of the Earth is misaligned with the, uh, the spin axis, right? For neutron stars also, it might happen that magnetic axis and its own spin axis are misaligned. So in that case, when the neutron star is spinning, uh, the magnetic uh, axis, which you can say, uh, visualize as a bar magnet, it also rotates. And you know that when there is a uh, dipolar magnet, dipole magnet or di uh, electrical dipole, they emit electromagnetic beam, right? So here, because of this rotating dipole, uh, the, there is emission of electromagnetic beam from uh, the north and south pole of this magnet, uh, which is a neutron star. And that emission is very beam-like. So what happens, say, uh, the, uh, I think this is my, say, Earth, and this is my uh, the, the magnetic axis. So it is rotating, and if it falls on the Earth, if your detector is detect uh, directed towards 
this object you can see it but it is only for momentary right because your magnetic beam is continuously spinning so you will detect it after one rotation you will detect it again as i am considering this eight ac outlet is the earth so you detect it after one spin period again detect it after one spin period again detect it so you cannot see anything else so when it falls on your detector you see it so for you you it will see something is blinking so that is why these objects are called uh, pulsars and first pulsar was discovered in 1967 by a phd student jocelyn bell and as I just said that uh, the, uh, only optical and radio wavelengths uh, can come to earth and we can see them well. So uh, that is why these pulsars are best studied in radio wavelength and we simply call them radio pulsars. That uh, does not mean that they emit only in radio wavelengths but we study them best in radio wavelength. Here are a few pulsars you see in different wavelengths means uh, their pulsation have been detected. Now the first pulsar was detected in, uh, in 1967 and today we know more than uh, 3000 pulsars. Most are isolated. There are some around, uh, around 350 in binary. There are two three body system and they are very interesting. Uh, two things. One is neutral star planet planet. That was actually really the first discovery of a planet outside our solar system. But when people talk about exoplanet, they don't mention it because it is not around a, uh, an element sequence star. And this triple system, neutron star, we, uh, white dwarf and white dwarf uh, system, that is also very interesting uh, because there are some test of strong equivalence principle few years ago with uh, that system. But I will mostly talk about binary stars, which we use to detect a low frequency gravitational wave or to uh, constraint equation of state or you can use them to test alternative theories of gravity or test general relativity i will tell about more so uh, these are binary pulsars means a pulsar a neutron star gravitationally bound to other or another star and that another object can be anything it can be a planet it can be a substellar system can be a main sequence can be another white dwarf actually most of the binaries we know are neutron star white dwarf system there are some uh, about 30 system neutron star neutron star binaries and in principle there can be neutron star black hole binaries also but we have not detected any such yet but why it is just a small number statistics because to get a black hole you need a more massive progenitor and there are not many such massive progenitors so it is just a small number of statistics if you keep on searching for new pulsar one day we will discover neutron star black hole binaries and when you have a neutron star and a black hole binary you can do lots of interesting uh, studies means theories of gravity and everything uh, so far the best thing we have are neutron star neutron star binaries i think it is not, not working Okay, somehow this is gone. Anyway, so uh, one interesting point is that there are. You can point with your cursor. Uh, no, it just stopped working, the cursor. Oh, okay, yeah, 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 that is a good idea. Yes. So there are around uh, 30 neutron star neutron star binaries. Uh, we call them double neutron star binaries. Uh, only one of them is double pulsar so remember the difference there are two neutron star it can happen that for one neutron star that electromagnetic beam is falling to uh, earth and for other neutron star the electromagnetic beam can go in any other direction or the other neutron star can be uh, the magnetic field can be slightly lower or there might be other things that it is not emitting so only one uh, neutron star neutron star binary is a double pulsar system means we can see radio pulsation 
information from both neutron star and uh, with that actually recently there was some constraint of uh, equation of state which I will tell you and as I say that we st use uh, the radio wavelength to study uh, these pulsars. So you need a radio detector, basically dish antennas, uh, very very large dish antennas. Uh, so my most favorite, uh, th those are the uh, top two are American uh, 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 radio telescopes, uh, Arecibo and Green Bank. And this is uh, GMRT. It is actually not very big, but 30 smaller means 25 meter diameter antenna together you can use as uh, a very big telescope and probably some of you were there the, the last week our postdoc Pratik was giving a talk on Indian pulsar timing array means this GMRT is so sensitive that our 3.5 years data is as good uh, as North American da uh, data of 12 years and the nature of this pulsar data is that the longer data you accumulate the data becomes better and better. So with our 3.5 years data we, uh, we are at par with uh, uh, the uh, 11 or 12 year data of North America. Uh, so it is just because GMRT is an excellent uh, instrument. I will tell a little bit about that. But although we have excellent instruments, so far we have detected pulsars only in our galaxy. But other galaxies may have lots of pulsars, but for that we need even better telescope. Probably in square kilometer array, which will come maybe 10 or 15 years for now, there will be pulsars discovered in other galaxies. Now we know what are neutron star and we know that why they are undead uh, stars because there is no nuclear fusion going on they are dead but they are still emitting uh, that is why they are undead but how we use them as laboratories to understand various theories of gravity that is because of a, te a technique we call timing studies what do you mean by timing studies i just mentioned that uh, it is just the spin period right for a neutron star it is uh, spinning and when once in uh, one spin period the beam falls on the earth you see so i will say okay so i have my detector i measure 100 signals consecutive signals when it arrived in my detector then i will predict when the next 100 pulse should arrive uh, and then to do this prediction there are lots of input coming on and those inputs give me all theories you will say what is the point or point means a neutron star spin period is one second so it will always come in one second interval first of all this one second spin period is not constant because neutron star is emitting energy that energy is coming at the cost of its rotational kinetic energy so it is slowing down we'll say okay then we have two parameters spin period and spin period derivative no because that is in the pulsar frame right and we are measuring on earth so there is a huge distance you'll say okay i will uh, say add the time distance by c you, uh, that is the main thing of timing analysis first the c means you cannot divide the distance by speed of light in vacuum because it is not vacuum between pulsar and earth there is a cold diffuse ionized plasma interstellar medium uh, in which electromagnetic wave travels through its group velocity so you have to model uh, the a priori we do not know means which direction the, uh, the signal is coming exact property of interstellar medium in that line of sight we do not know so we have to give guess value and we have to model it then what about distance that is not all uh, constant right because everything is moving earth, we are measuring the signal on earth earth is orbiting around the sun sun is moving, orbiting around the galactic center pulsars are also moving they actually have huge uh, velocity because they are born through explosive events supernova explosions so there, uh, there are many things and 
all those things we first do not know we give some guess values and we uh, to predict uh, when our next hundred pulse will come and then we just keep on changing our model parameters uh, to match our theoretical predictions with observed time of arrivals and the set of parameters which gives good values those are we call timing solution uh, and one thing means i just did not mention about the motion of the pulsar when you have a binary pulsar uh, means pulsar is moving in its orbit right that also you need to model so when you have a isolated pulsar means pulsar not in a binary you have only few parameters spin period spin period derivative coordinate the direction and its motion and uh, actually this spin period and spin period derivative means theoretically you can uh, derive this expression uh, 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 the values of spin period and spin period derivative gives the magnetic field at the surface of the neutron star that is how we know that many neutron star are so strong and this is some that is why we like to plot pulsars in this diagram we call pp dot diagram x axis is spin period y axis is spin period derivative so most of the pulsars are born uh, the, here means from supernova theory you can say they uh, the born in this region then as i just said uh, they are losing kinetic energy they are slowing down so their spin period is increasing so uh, you see it is almost like they are born with 0.1 second spin period then they are slowing down slowing down and when they are very slow means spin period is very large that time this dipole emission mechanism is not efficient en uh, enough and that is the true death of a undead neutron star that time they cannot emit electromagnetic emission uh, we don't have any name for those neutrons they are still neutron stars but not pulsars again something might happen at this stage if that neutron star is in a binary with a supergiant I, I mentioned that accretion phenomena it will pull matter from its companion and when the matter uh, falls onto neutron star means during that process there will be x-ray emission but that is another thing but during because of this accretion mechanism there is transfer of angular momentum means neutron star starts spinning very fast again we call them recycled pulsar and after this recycling mechanism this their spin period becomes in the millisecond order means a neutron star as heavy as star spins around its own axis in one millisecond and for uh, okay by uh, by the way for sun it takes to uh, around 25 days to spin around its own axis so you can imagine how fast they are spinning we call them millisecond pulsars and it is obvious from their formation scenario that they need a binary companion so that is how and why most of the millisecond pulsars in binaries and we use actually and they are the object we use as natural laboratories to test various theories of gravity how by using those timing solution means the models uh, parameters we need to predict uh, to uh, to predict the time of arrival of pulses and then we match when they are actually coming and what are the parameters as usual first it will come spin period rate of change of spin period uh, coordinate the direction uh, its motion then we are now talking about binary pulses right so there will be uh, to, uh, to orbital parameters the size of the orbit orbital period is shape uh, eccentricity of the orbit semi major axis uh, orientation of the orbit because uh, it is ellipse right so it matters whether ellipse is oriented like this or like this or like this then there is another t0 means where in the, the orbit the pulsar is is, is it uh, at the semi major axis or in uh, along the semi minor axis or in between so this t0 is we call epoch of periastron you know periastron is the point on the semi major axis the point which is closer to the uh, focus so when the uh, pulsar uh, was at this periastron passage that is also one parameter we fit 
then i mentioned that uh, you remember i showed that most of the pulsar binaries are with white dot components and both neutron stars are white dots are very dense compact objects strongly gravitating so general relativity comes into play and effects of general relativity comes through parameters which we call post keplerian orbital parameters and let me tell you uh, there are five post keplerian parameters we fit first precision of the orbit means if it was a classical binary means say this is the binary orbit object would move in the orbit but now because of general relativity the orbit itself precise that probably you know that it was a uh, even happens for uh, orbit of our mercury and planet mercury then rate of change of orbital period when there are two objects gravitationally bound to each other and they are moving around each other they emit gravitational waves uh, this is a prediction of general relativity and when uh, like any other uh, waves this gravitational wave also carries energy and that energy comes at the cost of gravitational binding energy of the uh, system so it is lo losing gravitational uh, binding energy so two objects they uh, keep on coming close uh, close and close so their orbit is shrinking so uh, that means orbital period is decreasing so that is the eventually they will merge but that is a separate thing we the objects we are studying are far far before merger but this rate of change of orbital periods is is detectable and when the first binary pulsar which was actually coincidentally a neutron star neutron star object was discovered uh, the discoverers model this uh, rate of change of orbital period and it exactly matched with the theoretical prediction here you can see their plot those uh, solid line is theory and those points are the uh, data point so you see such a good agreement and uh, 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 emission of gravitational wave is the only reason which can cause the, the decay of orbital period right that is why this discovery is called the first de uh, uh, detection of gravitational wave although they say it is indirect detection but i do not understand why it is more indirect because even in LIGO you see interferometric pattern if that is not indirect then why this indirect that is a confusion but anyway then there is a shapiro delay which is the effect of space-time curvature uh, of the companion of the pulsar and that is significant when the companion is white dot because that is also strongly gravitating and will be even stronger if uh, it would, uh, would be a black hole and this can be parameterized with two parameter mass of the companion and viewing geometry because uh, that tells you that whether the signal comes very close to the companion or not so there are two parameter inclination that Shapiro shape parameters S and Shapiro range parameter which contains uh, the companion mass MC. Now the last post Keplerian parameter we fit this is called Einstein delay. This is just conversion between the proper time in the pulsar frame to our uh, earth frame. Uh, now uh, sorry for this slide I usually don't like to show equations in my talks but I cannot help this. So here when you do timing analysis, as I said, first you fit Keplerian parameters or orbital period and eccentricity. That is PB and E. PB is orbital period, E is eccentricity. So your data analysis has gave you uh, those two parameters. Then uh, so you fitted the post Keplerian parameters, which are right hand side omega dot rate of precision of the orbit, Einstein delay, Shapiro delay and rate of change of orbital parameters. You just fit it. You did not use those theoretical expressions. But in these theoretical expressions, you see there are two more parameters, pulsar mass and companion mass that you do not fit. Because to fit uh, when that pulse signal will come, you don't need them. You just need Keplerian and post Keplerian parameters. But now here you have five theoretical equations and two unknowns. Mass of the pulsar, MP and mass of the companion. 
So you, from two equation, you can easily uh, to, to solve and find the value. Uh, any, you can take any two equation and you measure mass of the pulsar and mass of the companion. That is how we measure um, pulsar and companion masses. But another interesting fact: these equations are, uh, gives you indirect test of general relativity because all those equations were derived under general relativity. Now, say I use the first two equation, I find some value of mass of the pulsar and companion and you take uh, last two equations and you find another set of values of mass uh, of pulsar and companion. If there is a disagreement between our result, you can say okay either one is doing wrong or any one or all equations are wrong. But it never happened. Means all mass measurements means using all equations uh, agree very well. So that means all equations are correct. That sometimes is called indirect test of general relativity. And that is how we measure pulsar masses. You remember this plot I have shown means x axis radius, y axis mass, and those lines are theoretical mass radius predictions, and those are error bars, measurement of mass, and we could not measure radius, right? Because there are not, uh, these equations, post Keplerian parameters, there is no radius is not a parameter there. So that is how we cannot measure radius. So so far the uh, most uh, okay. I am. Uh, I need another five minutes. Uh, I am running little late, but it is okay. So the most massive neutron star is that. Uh, the one pulsar we call JS1614. This is actually named after the coordinate and it is two solar mass. What does it say? It can say that there are some equation of state which cannot theoretically produce a neutron star as massive as two solar mass. So those equation of states are uh, ruled out. There is something wrong in the nu uh, nu nuclear force model they use or something is wrong that uh, we don't need to care. So like here that MS1 that is actually called Muller Serot 1 named after the uh, physicist. So that is invalid. But still you see there are lots of equation of state valid. Means as I said I, I like it before I say okay this pulsar J1614 its radius is 11.5 kilometer. You say no no uh, I like uh, PAL1 the uh, radius of this neutron star is 13.5 kilometer. We don't know uh, which one is correct. So few years ago when there was that LIGO Virgo merger of neutron star neutron star event which I said uh, the, supported the idea of gold production. The, uh, that time actually people needed to simulate the tidal deformability of neutron star and using that depends on equation of state which uh, depending on that they could uh, give some allowed region but there they could give just some allowed region of the phase space and still lots of equations are valid. Similar effort was uh, done by X-ray groups by modeling thermonuclear bars. There also they can give some allowed region, but nobody can pinpoint the equation of state yet. But recently there was some effort. Uh, okay, that I will tell you. And this slide I already mentioned that ma matching of all these equations and uh, indirect proof. So forget that. So what I was saying that recently using pulsar timing there is a uh, step forward for constraining equation of state. That is using one effect called less thinning or frame dragging effect. Means whenever in common term we say what is general relativity we say okay general relativity means if there is mass space time uh, is curved to, uh, towards the, that mass. But the spin of one object also affect the space time curvature and for binary pulsar that was modeled by lens and thinning and this effect is known as frame dragging effect and that effect has been detected for other system but for pulsars uh, means for binary system this frame dragging effect the spin that actually contributes in the precision.
so uh, precision of the orbit so few slides ago when i showed you that precision of the orbit and some analytical expression that is only the uh, effect of mass in the general relativity uh, and that has actually two terms uh, we call post newtonian terms omega dot 1 pn and 2 pn but this frame dragging effect is another term we call lens thinning term so if you can decouple your observation is sensitive enough and you can decouple this lens thinning term and measure it then it would be very interesting because this lens thinning term depends on the moment of inertia of the neutron star and in newtonian spheres moment of inertia depends on mass and radius you can say oh if we can measure uh, mass from other post keplerian parameters and then lens thinning moment of inertia we get radius yeah this is basically that but uh, uh, here you need to calculate moment of inertia under gr whose expression is slightly different so recently in december last year i mean it is just few months ago using that double pulsar that is why what i said that two neutron star in a binary both are pulsar using the double pulsar system they gave some with a large error bar they gave some uh, uh, value of moment of inertia of one of the pulsar and that actually ruled out many equation of state here i show moment of in radius versus moment of inertia curve using some semi empirical formula and this was done in 2016 so many of the equation of state can be ruled out and i would like to mention that this is actually a very simplistic calculation uh, using a very semi uh, empirical formula you can do much better and that actually anyone of us can do using the full gr code uh, once i was playing so let us forget and i already mentioned that using the three body system neutron star white dwarf white dwarf system there a few years ago they give, uh, gave a very precise test means strong equivalence principle it it actually really uh, holds and uh, i would not say many thing about that but only a small thing when this paper uh, came means uh, they needed to use the rate of change of orbital period and there are external uh, effects which affect the measured value of rate of change of orbital period and our ex student dhruv patak who is now postdoc at ayuka he worked on modeling the external effects and actually when this uh, people uh, say, uh, say, uh, did this uh, calculation they used Dhruv's code that is uh, what I am trying to inspire students for if you write any code please make it public uh, so that uh, other people can use it uh, because that will be good right as a scientist we should work for advancement of science so i'm almost done as uh, uh, one thing i would say that so far although general relativity has passed all that experimental test but we cannot still say that general relativity is not some approximation of some other uh, theories right so there are uh, various theories like scalar tensor theories and many things and one thing is that the, although general relativity allows only quadrupolar gra gravitational wave but like scalar tensor theories they allow monopolar or dipolar theories uh, it means monopolar and dipolar emission of gravitational wave it is possible and if those theories are correct and if uh, those other types of gravitational wave emission is possible the, the, the rate of change of orbital period will be different so if you uh, and it, it is possible that different types of gravitational wave is uh, being emitted so, uh, so there are some effort to see whether monopolar or dipolar gravitational wave is uh, there so for using pulsar white dwarf system people placed some limit on the, uh, the uh, constants of scalar tensor theories uh, you can improve those limits of those uh, parameters if you have a neutron star black hole binary so probably from 10 years from now we can do um, 
uh, I'll skip and here I am coming uh, for last two minutes on pulsar timing array. I don't want to spend much time on pulsar timing array because this is a so exciting field it uh, it should be a separate one hour talk but i only want to see that okay there, there was reason that last five six year we all were very excited about all LIGO detection of gravitational waves but that is only the tip of the iceberg because like uh, electromagnetic waves as a broad range of frequencies gravitational waves also have various frequency ranges uh, and various sources generates gravitational waves at various uh, frequencies so LIGO can detect only high frequency gravitational waves when you will have LISA means laser space interferometer it will be able to detect mid frequency gravitational wave and then there are low frequency gravitational waves mostly generated by merger of galaxies merger of supermassive black holes etc uh, how do we detect them uh, so here you need actually very long uh, detector so instead of building any detector we use pulsars Please remember here we are not using uh, not trying to detect gravitational waves em be, uh, emitted by the pulsars they also emit gravitational waves but that will be detected by LIGO people but here we are using pulsars as our detectors and we are seeing whether they bear the signature of gravitational waves and this is a very complicated thing because uh, the, uh, the pulsars themselves sometimes behave uh, because they are actually neutron star there are things like star quakes bleeds many things so we that is why you need to observe many pulsars so say you are more, uh, so observing 50 pulsars if you suddenly see some strange behavior of one pulsar you say okay th something is wrong in this uh, pulsar maybe there is a star quake but if all your 50 pulsars suddenly show something that means something is coming and we know theory some uh, theoretical relation if gravitational wave come what will be the nature of this uh, common behavior so this uh, experiment is known as pulsar timing array experiment array means array of pulsars and timing means we are doing timing analysis and as I was mentioning and Shanton also kindly mentioned this is an international effort going for almost last 20 years uh, most uh, it started by North Americans using Arecibo and Greenman telescope then th there is Australian group th there is European group and from in 2015 five of us we started Indian pulsar timing array group and now uh, in 2015 uh, we started by five or six people now we are more than 40 people and uh, uh, we are using uh, GMRT and actually for last few years we have some Japanese colleague who are, who are also using our uh, instrument and we are part of international consortium and probably that is why I don't see Pratik here because some young members of NPT are very busy these days actually this week is our busy week we are all sitting together analyzing data because our data we are planning to release our data to the whole world uh, 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 by end of this month and we are combining our data with international pulsar timing array and more result and to do this our effort is to study uh, means to detect low frequency gravitational wave but many other interesting science is coming means we are understanding interstellar medium very well and like last year one of pulsar we are observing the sun was on the line of sight and there was a coronal mass ejection and that we could detect using our pulsar uh, timing data so there are lots of things coming up and the eventual detection actually there is some signature that probably it is there so we need to make the data more sensitive so more data is coming by all the telescope so uh, we are hopeful that within next two three years there will be low detection of nanohertz gravitational wave so i'll stop here but before stopping to, uh, to inspire our uh, all the students i see i would like to tell you that 
most of the important results in pulsar astronomy was led by students it starts from discovery of the first pulsar discovery of the first binary pulsar uh, that halsteller binary first millisecond pulsar uh, the double pulsar first stereo pulsar first transitional pulsar means it accretes matter and stops accreting mm. Then slowest pulsar. So uh, probably uh, you people will discover uh, some more exotic objects. So let me stop here and I, I don't have any summary. I would only like to say pulsars are very exotic objects and life cannot be more fun than doing pulsar astronomy. Probably I don't know whether you agree with me or not. Okay, so I am stopping here. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Bakhti, for telling us about this fascinating physics of neutron stars. So I'm sure there will be many questions. So uh, this session is open for questions. These uh, low frequencies are very, very low, right? Like uh, how many years? Uh, yeah, it is. I mean, we are trying to detect 10 to the power uh, 9 hertz. So you convert it. So, but it is not the uh, end because you see the, there are even lower frequencies means like primordial gravitational wave that we are not uh, trying to detect we are trying to detect means what we call low frequency gravitational wave but there are even ultra low frequency gravitational wave so won't it take a lot of time to uh... Uh, uh, that uh, depends upon like, uh, where it is coming from right means that is the distance so we have not detected so we, we cannot say but most of the uh, this a uh, pulsar timing array detection most probably will be a uh, stochastic uh, background means there are many supermassive black holes are merging so there is a background gravitational wave if we detect that that is a background right we cannot say that where it is coming from so that case we cannot say how uh, means which signal we are seeing but they are old means all gravitational uh, super, because they are not in our galaxies so this is not yet uh, done i mean hmm? it's it's not yet been done yes. yeah yeah so we are hoping to detect to the next two years so wish us luck <laughs> Um, a very nice talk. Um, I have a question not really about pulsars, but about the materials on Earth that originated from pulsars use. Yep. So, um, did they? So, is it that they came from the supernova explosion, or is there something uh, that is actually made in a pulsar itself that uh, yes. can end up so here? Just let me. Yeah. So, can you switch up the light? Probably there, right? So you see there are exploding massive stars means which are supernova explosions. Those are the green elements. But supernova can, uh, cannot produce other elements like uh, the, uh, like iron or actinium, uh, radium, all these things. Okay. My question is, I guess if gold is produced in merging neutron stars, how does... So, how does the gold that was produced by neutron stars end up in our solar system? I mean, oh, yeah. so because see, we are not first generation of stars. Uh, like, so, uh, do I have that plot somewhere? So, here, here you see that, uh, see, 
there is first diff diffuse uh, cloud and star is forming, star is dying, then merger of neutron star. So when there is merger of neutron star, the inside thing would probably form a black hole. But the outer things that gold and other things, means other heavy elements, they will be ejected and they will form a diffuse cloud. Then they will come uh, with hydrogen and helium and they will form a star which will uh, uh, contain those traces of those elements. Then the, the, when the planets form, those will come. So we are, as we say that we are all stardust, right? So we are, uh, we came from stars, but we came from neutral star also. So as we see uh, from star, uh, sun like stars, the neutron stars are emerging. So yeah, 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 yeah. emerging means emerging means they are creating from sun. No, no, sun will become a white dot, but you need no, no, uh, some massive stars. Yeah, from yes. sun. Uh, so my question is, the magnetic field of the stars is very small, and the uh -huh. neutron star magnetic field is ten to the power twelve tesla type of thing. Uh -huh. So how it is becoming the small magnetic field is becoming that large? Yeah, the, uh, 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 that is a, uh, it's a very good question. Uh, a, we don't understand very well, but there are some theories. First, one is we say, okay, it is conservation of flux because, as uh, I see, your star was very big, right? And say the density of field lines was something else. When it was squeezed, the density of field lines in increased. So uh, you can model it like that. And another point, uh, probably you have st studied that means the, all these neutrons and protons, they have their nuclear magnetons, right? So that magnetic field also comes into play. So there are actually various uh, the models, means some people gave models that something happens during supernova, but they, these two are the most uh, trustable theories we still be, uh, we believe. Uh, so, uh, but it is not very well established, but these are the only options we have. So here in this panel, that huh? there is a red giant to supernova explosion. So yeah. why, why, what is the physics behind this supernova ex explosion? Uh, okay. Uh, uh, yes, the, uh, this will uh, uh, help. So. See, here means the, this is a massive star which will give, uh, means the end state of a massive star which will give you supernova explosion. So when the nuclear uh, fusion stops, means it start collapsing. What happens, means first those outer cells, they will collapse, they will fall to inside iron core and they will bounce back. And that is the supernova explosion and they will give supernova remnant and the inner core that will collapse to uh, give you uh, the neut uh, neutron star or black hole depending upon the mass of the core. That is why I mean say uh, it, uh, the initial star before supernova explosion was say 25 uh, five solar mass and only when it becomes a neutron star, uh, it is only two solar mass and the rest just uh, bounced back and gave supernova explosion. Uh, thanks for the nice talk ma'am. Thank you. Uh, a small question but uh -huh. slightly out there. Uh -huh. uh, since uh, you mentioned that uh, we have a pretty decent idea of that by using uh, different equations of state, we can uh, sort of predict what kind of elements would be there inside a neutron star. Uh, would this be an effective uh, way to sort of look at pulsars and try to establish what kind of stars they were when they were main sequence? For example, so could we be detecting things that look like remnants of population three stars, for example? Yeah, that uh, that actually is possible. Not, 
it is not a very easy task but uh, i have not uh, talked about that aspect is what we call neutron stars they actually have some normal matter crust and when you do x-ray studies you get signature of atmosphere of neutron star and uh, the crust uh, it is possible means uh, you can get emission and absorption lines in x-ray and sometimes if uh, some of the neutron star you see them in optical or, or ultraviolet rays it can tell you something about the elements they had yeah it is very good question it is possible to manjiri uh, professor ramachandran has a question over youtube uh -huh. what is the most abundant element on earth and where does it come from Oh, that is a good question, but I do not know very well. So far, it is my periodic table. Mm. Yeah, I think something about not the heavy elements, right? Uh, uh, maybe, uh, yeah, I, I do not know. Uh, iron, right? But, uh, okay, but... But what about oxygen? We have such a huge. Uh, 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 silicon, iron, but uh, atmosphere is mostly nitrogen, right? Huh? Yeah, yes. Yeah, yeah, so what is your definition of oxygen? Yeah, so no, no, I mean, no, no oxygen, uh, it doesn't, uh, we are not talking about pure elements, oxides count. Uh -huh. Yeah, perhaps we can uh, say iron silicon. Pure element is Okay, silicon comes from exploding stars, so does iron. Silicon is only available as silicon. Are there any further questions? So, uh, any interesting uh, models or uh, theories had to be tested specifically in uh, uh, black hole uh, neutron star binaries? Yeah, so uh, it will help us to uh, uh, improvements. So far, we have tested the scalar tensor theories, means you cannot test, you cannot say that those theories are right or wrong, you could place some limit on those uh, parameters of scalar tensor theories, those can be improved uh, using uh, neutron star black hole binaries and also means like uh, no hair theorem means uh, if black holes ha had magnetic field and if it is a compact uh, uh, binary uh, they could have interacted means near neutron star signal and black hole signal so that might also be possible so uh, it means we have to do very accurate timing analysis to see what we can do with black hole neutron star binaries but definitely improving the the values of parameters of alternative theories is possible. Okay, see no further questions. So thanks uh, Manjuriti for this very fascinating talk. Thank you.